Hi, I'm Ann DeLisi. And I'm Chef James Regato. And today we're talking with State Senator Mallory McMurrow. She joins us to talk about how the state government and the restaurant industry were forced to come together when the COVID-19 pandemic hit and reflect on what worked and what didn't. We also talk about how climate change and protecting the Great Lakes ecosystem affects our food supply here in Michigan. All right, so we have State Senator Mallory McMorrow of Royal Oak with us today. And uh, while I don't know how great you are in the kitchen at cooking, I do know <laughs> that you have uh, quite a bit of experience um, with the restaurant industry from the, uh, you know, the, the state side that, that we dealt with for the last two and a half years with shutdowns and restrictions and the MLCC and indoor, outdoor masks and all the chaos that ensued um, during that time. And I wanted to have you on the show today because I can say that um, while I think many restaurants felt um, either shoved aside or confused or uh, neglected um, or mismanaged, you were the probably the only politician that uh, reached out to me or was available. And we actually met on the patio at Mabel Gray during that time um, with the simple uh, conversation of how can I help? Where are you hurting? What do you need? And even if things were changing so rapidly, we couldn't create real policy or anything. Um, you were an ear and you um, cared and you went and applied some of that towards uh, conversations with, you know, fellow government officials. So I wanted to kind of pick up where we left off with, you know, the food system's broken. The restaurant system is uh, recovering, but still struggling. And I think there's reflections of that probably in the city, state and national government. Uh, and, inter and international governing communities as well. So without being too broad, I just wanted to kind of check in and see what your uh, take on the restaurant industry, um, where we're going, what what went wrong, what went right, and uh, just kind of take your pulse on where things are from your perspective uh, in the government. Yeah, and I'm glad to be here. And I will say, first of all, uh, my husband is a much better cook than I am, <laughs> but I, I go way back in the industry. So I was a bartender uh, I got my bartending license in New Jersey at 18 because that's something that you can do. Uh, worked in restaurants through college. So it's always been something I'm really passionate about. I love restaurants. Uh, and the entire experience of the pandemic and, you know, we're coming out hopefully on the other side of it. We know a lot more now. Um, but I think looking back, I tried to do exactly what you said, reach out and just talk to as many people as possible. And I think that if there's any parallels between the challenges of the restaurant industry and government, it's that we just don't do enough of that. There just aren't enough sit down conversations. How are you doing? How are you feeling? What do you need? Instead of this retreating to your camp and uh, COVID was a perfect example of, I don't necessarily know that anybody was right. Everybody was trying to make the best decisions with all of the information we had in real time and history is going to tell how that went um, I know that when I was taking a look at where we were at in Michigan, uh, Harvard was publishing a lot of really good documentation on what happened during the 1918 flu pandemic and that there was consistent research that said that those who cities that that implemented stricter uh, restrictions early on recovered much faster. And I think that that was at least my hope early on. But now we're two and a half years later and hopefully we've learned a lot about how we continue to operate and thrive and fix things that were broken. Is there anything that you saw then that you look back and, you know, in the last two and a half years, was there any, you know, thing that you're like, that was completely a disaster? Like, was there any, anything you would go back and change? I mean, I think everything was just moving so fast. And, and I remember when we, when the state was shifting towards, okay, outdoor structures were allowed, but restaurants were moving faster than the state departments could put out clear, cohesive guidelines about what that meant. So I had conversations, some were arguments with restaurant owners who had spent a lot of money building outdoor structures, but that didn't solve the issue of air circulation, which was what we were learning was really how COVID spread was not surfaces. You know, I, I just remember back to when we were getting groceries delivered and like washing them mm -hmm. before bringing them into our house, which was yeah. wild that we all lived through that. Um, but that was, you know, if anything, I think government is slow and I came from the private sector before running for office for the first time in 2018. And it's really tough to, 
to be at the pace that the restaurant industry needed to go with clear guidelines and getting to a place where a lot of these outdoor structures had no windows, no ventilation, no circulation. And it would have actually been better to be indoors with the HVAC systems that we had, but we, we just didn't know that yeah. at the time. Um, and I know that that was a really frustrating pain point for a lot of restaurant owners. Yeah, I think too, it's interesting because, you know, we were somebody, we, our, my restaurant, Mabel Gray, we, we stayed open the whole time. So there's a handful of us that were, you know, from day one, I think She Wolf was probably the earliest. I mean, I feel like they were like open, mm -hmm. you know, that they shut down for maybe like 12 hours and then they were like a grocery store. <laughs> um, but a lot of, you know, there's a lot of tenacity in restaurant owners that stayed open. And, and you know, I, I was really impressed and inspired and at the level it took to, to stay open. And, but at the same time, you look at like, you look at cities like Miami, right? Which never shut down and they have good weather. They have things on their side, but now you look at like Michelin is in Florida. Miami is like a super city. The real estate's booming. You know, now you got a celebrity in Ron DeSantis. Like it's, it's interesting to look at cities and states that stayed open and cities and states that shut down. And yeah, I mean, I think you're right. We're going to, we're all going to learn a lot and you know, nobody had a crystal ball, but it's just, it's peculiar um, to see that from a, a business owner's perspective. And I'm not saying anything should have happened differently because I, I agree. I mean, I, I responded to every um, transition. And I remember there was, you know, local Michigan restaurant owners trying to like, you know, form a militia and stay open. And there was a lot of silly things going on. I just wanted to respond and do whatever you tell me to do. Uh, not you, but, you know, the governing bodies. And, you know, wh what is that from your perspective when you see cities that stayed open and thrived and you see cities, you know, like, is that, it, it, how do you wrestle with that? Because it's probably ammunition for like, you know, your rivals or people running against you. It's like, there's a lot of uh, the business sector definitely bleeds into the government sector with like, how do you navigate that? You know, and what, and what do you see from your perspective now? Should we have stayed open? Is it, is it too, is there too many variables to be, it's not cut and dry? Yeah, I think that's probably a little too binary. And what I appreciate about Mabel Gray and some other restaurants, and I think there, there's a parallel between restaurants and government, right? There were some restaurants who really saw what was happening and tried to innovate and tried to do new things and tried to figure out how to stay open safely, how to do, I took one of your cooking classes when yeah, I was extremely you. pregnant, which gave me uh, <laughs> something, something good to do when I was stuck at home. Um, and then we had some restaurant owners who just didn't and wanted to sue the government, right? And I think that I have colleagues who operate sort of in the same mentality. There's some of us who I really admire who want to get creative and I, it wasn't a magic wand, but I introduced the first versions of cocktails to go in social districts to say, how can we create safer outdoor spaces? How can we provide at least a small revenue stream yeah. for restaurants who want to versus some who were just like, it's the way we've always done it or nothing. Yeah. And I think that there are definitely ways in Michigan. I mean, we're not Miami. We're not warm. It doesn't work. Although having visited New York, it just the <laughs> the balls of New Yorkers to sit outside in like six inches of snow and still eat <laughs> is something I think that's admirable. I don't know that I would want to do that necessarily in Michigan, but I think it's how can we be more nimble to adopt creative solutions? And that goes both ways, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's business owners and government, I think hopefully working better together to say what's gonna work in our state, what's gonna work in our regions, what's gonna work for our constituents, and then what's standing in the way of that happening. Um, and those were, you know, the two examples of legislation that I put up. Again, didn't solve everything, no, but, those but are, it was creative. Those are great. I mean, th those were the things at the time, those were life rafts when you're like cocktails to go. I mean, you know, that, like that was something that was like, you know, yeah, it would have made sense to roll that out in the middle of March, you know, like, yeah. Hey, we're shutting down, but you can do this. Right. So, and, and yeah, you're right. Government runs slow, but no, those were huge things. Even now with like, you know, essentially the beer self-serve beer laws that just passed. Yes. Like there's a lot of good things that have come out, um, you know, of the government pivoting. I, I'm, I'm, I definitely feel uh, like people like you, I'm happy you're in government because we can have conversations. And I feel like, I'm like, oh, wow, look, this law passed. That's a solution. And I agree. I mean, I wrote an op-ed for the free press during this about, okay, there's a little bit too much, you know, sitting on your hands and complaining, like just innovate, be creative. You know, the public was wonderful. I mean, the cooking classes you yeah. mentioned, like every time we pivoted, there was a, there was a line of people ready to receive it. And not every restaurant was that lucky, but I think that the public was more flexible than people gave them credit for. Um, but yeah, I think that that, you know, pandemic was just all the things that existed, like the problems in government, the problems in food were always there. Yeah. The pandemic just really just put a spotlight and just those, those cracks became right. know, voids. Well, and I hope that for, for my colleagues in government, you know, 
the thing that I tell people who are advocating for issues or the things they are concerned about all the time is you have to recognize that your elected official has to know a little bit about everything. Yeah. And we all have our own area of expertise, but that's very different. I mean, you're an expert in a way I'm never going to be in running and operating a restaurant in the food system and what's broken in it. So that's why I do things like trying to reach out because I want to learn so that I can be an advocate for those things. Some of my best bills that I'm most proud of are things that constituents have brought to me directly and said, I've identified a problem. Here's a solution. Will you introduce it? And if we can open up more of that dialogue where it's less about winning, you know, the idea of the cultural politics is all about winning or losing and you have to pick your side and you have to fight it out. And at the end of the day, I think you were exactly right that we all want restaurants that we love. We all want communities that we love. We all want the same thing. How can we tear down some of that tribalism so that we can actually have those honest conversations and not attack somebody if they have an idea that doesn't work for the industry, right? Because it's not saying like, you're wrong and you should be out, but making space for let's all learn about each other. And that gives me more capability as an elected official to offer up things that are going to be real solutions and not, <laughs> you know, surface level ideas that don't actually fix anything. Yeah. And, you know, and not to, not to stir the pot, but I think things that stung for restaurants too was like, you saw certain, you know, there's rules in place, right? No more than six people, indoor, outdoor, spacing, masking. And then you see people in leadership gathering in spaces, yeah. you know, whether it's locally or Gavin Newsom doing, you know, French laundry, like, you know, that that is kind of where I think, you know, the haves and the have nots, that the divide only grows. So while I totally agree with your perspective, I think that, that that's an interesting thing to, you know, I imagine from your perspective, that has to feel like two steps backwards when moments like that happen. Oh, it does. I, because it's, I got pregnant during the pandemic. We were so careful, I think probably more so than most people about, I didn't go anywhere except to the Capitol because we didn't know what was going to happen if if a pregnant woman got COVID. We just didn't know anything about it. So it always... I did all of my live streams from my house. I tried to keep up with constituents. I tried to call people. And anytime I saw any elected official breaking the rules for their convenience, I'm just like, come on. Yeah. Like this, we, we all have to be in this together. And there has to be a recognition that those of us in these roles, you have to lead by example as well, not just put rules out and say, okay, this is the safest thing, but I'm going to do something else. I mean, we saw what happened in, in the UK. <laughs> Like right. that damn broke because right. at some point people are sick of it if you break your own rules. Yeah, I was in Ireland during watching that live. You know, it's just like, <laughs> you know, in, in Ireland, especially with Brexit and Northern yeah. Ireland, just like the hot mess that's going on over there. Yeah, I mean, it's, and this isn't, this isn't, you know, special to Michigan or to the U.S. I mean, the whole world right now is kind of having a, a you know, a reckoning. Look at Italy right now. And yeah. The whole world is having a, a reckoning on how people want to be governed and how the world is. And I think it, all these problems have always been there. COVID was really just this, like the new, you know, the, the new agitator. Yeah. And I think it pushed it all to the forefront. I, and this is going to sound really nerdy. I put together a PowerPoint presentation in my first year in office about how beyond any single policy, our biggest issue was trust right now. There is no trust in government, you know, government ranks below lawyers and <laughs> like, you know, basically we're last and you're, we're never going to get to a place where we can go through a crisis and come out the other side okay if we don't rebuild that trust. And we saw that, you know, Michigan, not a proud accomplishment. We were the first state in the country to have a major COVID protest. On April 15th was the traffic jam protest. April 30th was the armed um, storming of our capital. And when you saw four armed gunmen in the gallery in that photo, what you don't see is right below them is me because we were there and it's like living in a fishbowl. And that's sort of what's terrifying to me. And, and COVID was just, it unleashed all of it because there was so much anger and we haven't done the work previously to rebuild that trust. We have to, if we're ever going to get back to a place where we're on the same team. Yeah. And how, I, how do you do that? <sighs> I mean, I can only operate in my small bubble in the world. Yeah. So what we try to do, you know, I host a weekly live stream mm -hmm. every single week that the Senate is in session where we share what's going on in the state, what's going on in the legislature, and then we do live Q&A. And it's on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. I try to be really available. I try to call people who 
don't like me is a nice way to put it. Uh, a constituent called me, I'm not even going to say it on, on, on air, but a tyrannical C word. Uh, and my husband Ugh. had it made into a candle. So <laughs> it was just like, you take the hits at some point. But Did you talk to that person? I did. How did that go? Not great. Um, I had this attitude really early on in the pandemic that people are just really angry and they want to vent. And if I can be that punching bag, then fine. So my poor staff, they told me not to, but I was calling a lot of people back who didn't genuinely want to engage. And this particular conversation, you know, this was a, a man who called the governor Hitler and said mm -hmm. that we were all tyrants and this is just like the Holocaust. And I had to stop him at some point and say, you are welcome to air your grievances and express any frustration with me. That's all fine, but we don't tolerate anti-Semitism especially because my husband is Jewish. Mm -hmm. And his response to me was, you are the exact person who killed your husband's family in the Holocaust. Oh my God. Yeah. And that's when I kind of stopped calling everybody back and recognized there are just some people who don't want to engage with you and they just want somebody to punch. And that's not, it's not my job. It's not my staff's job. Um, but we try to kind of not overcompensate, but create more opportunities for people to hear from me directly. Um, throughout COVID, as we kind of figured out gathering outside was a safer thing to do, mm -hmm. we started doing what we called uh, precinct potlucks, where we found a neighbor throughout the district who would offer up their driveway and we would canvas the neighborhood and just say, hey, I'm going to be here in a week. Come out and meet me one-on-one. -on -one. And we got really small groups. And it was great because it, there were neighbors who had never even met their neighbors, but they got the flyers mm -hmm. and said, this is a cool opportunity. I've never met my state senator. Was there actually food there? You called it there a There was. Okay. Yeah. We, and we said on the flyer, like we brought food. Okay. I brought food, but also asked like, hey, bring something to share nice. if you're willing to. What was the best thing you ate on the potluck tour? Oh, the best thing I ate on the potluck tour. I mean, it was all like regular finger food. Oh, but I get it. it anytime, you know, somebody came out flexing those. Oh yeah. Anytime I'm in Troy and people bring samosas, I'm just like, oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am very excited about this. That's, fair. That's, That's fair. pretty great. That seems like um, something that not all state senators do. Um, you are forging your own path that way. And to have those conversations that I'm sure you knew we're not going to be fun and most likely not productive. But there have to be those wins every once in a while for you where you actually have a conversation um, where each side learns a little something and people get to see your side as well. Were there those moments that made you more hopeful um, and maybe develop some trust that you're hoping? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we get that type of positive feedback all the time, especially oh, on hear. things like our live streams where where so many people have emailed and said, I am completely opposite from you on the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you do that and you explain your positions and I feel like I know who you are, I really respect that. And I think that's the best type of feedback we can have. And I've even had people say, I'll vote for you because I know where you are on things. You know, I don't feel like you're hiding anything from me. And that's hopefully the goal. Black perspectives haven't always been centered in the telling of America's story. Now, we're taking center stage. Introducing NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, a collection of Black-led stories from NPR's podcasts. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get your podcasts. What, and related to food and obviously agriculture to me, restaurants are a part of agriculture. We're, we're the end of the line, essentially. You know, what do you think right now is one of the more pressing things going on in the agricultural community that people aren't aware of? Is there anything that's, you know, that's, that you're worried about or that you're excited about or law that's coming? Like what is going on behind the scenes in the agricultural community that you think more people need to know about? I mean, there's, there's so many small bills I move that I think are important. So we just passed a bill um, that basically incentivizes local distillers if they use at least 40% Michigan-made products, which is, you know, supporting both local distillers in the state and 
hopefully providing an incentive to support more of our farmers within the state. That's just one thing that we can help. But I am very concerned about the impacts of climate change on Michigan. And I am devastated by the political gridlock right now because I work with colleagues who frankly don't even want to acknowledge it. And and they're some of the same colleagues who represent more of the outstate agricultural areas. Um, it, it is, that is why we need those voices. That's why we need you to advocate and show up and say, this is how it's affecting my day-to-day life because we need all of my colleagues to hear and understand that. Now, what about um, the Great Lakes, right? Because the Great Lakes are obviously, we view them as Michigan lakes, but they're not. They're, I mean, they're basically a regional product. And we share borders in many states, Canada. Right. Um, I guess for me, I'm naive because I look at the lakes like Michigan's problem and our asset, but they're essentially affected by two international governments. Yep. But, but I'm assuming the federal government has more impact than the local government does statewide for the Great Lakes. It's a combination of both. And it, it was really interesting when I ran for office for the first time. I mean, I consider myself an environmentalist, but I talked to voters who align on the other side of the aisle who view the Great Lakes as a national security issue. Because as we look at climate change, you know, I had a woman who who asked me where I was at on water because she thought clean water was going to be the cause of the next world war. And we are sitting on a tremendous asset as we see droughts around the country and around the world that a lot of other regions simply don't have. Um, So it's a combination of both. So within the state level, we are um, pushing legislation related to PFAS cleanup and remediation, making sure that there are actual real penalties for some of these consistent polluters who are leaching these chemicals into the Great Lakes with, with frankly, no consequence. I think that's one of the most terrifying things to me is there are very little um, kind of sticks or carrots that actually exist if you've got one single bad actor company who just avoids fines for decades and then they go under. Um, a perfect example was the green news that we saw on 696 coming out of Madison Heights that that's gets like, into our water system. Right by my house. That's like, yeah. <laughs> and it was it was a, a very visible example because, you know, that pipe burst and it was winter. So you saw this lime green. Because you see it. You see it. And, that's, and, and it's, it exists. I mean, like things like this are happening all the time. They're happening all the time. But they're not necessarily always oozing onto your morning right. commute. So that was, I mean, that that is one example of of something that happens around our communities and around our state all the time is that there are companies who don't take responsibility. And this isn't a knock on every company because there are a lot of companies who are great corporate citizens. Um, But that is something that I'm watching now is why don't we have stronger regulation tools where you can't just avoid paying fines for decades. And then it's what taxpayers responsibility to clean it up. So making sure that we have stronger, um, polluter pay laws we have more in place. I didn't realize until I got into this job that 80% of dams are privately owned. So when we saw the Midland Dam collapse, that's another example of this is not public infrastructure. It's it's a private single person owning this dam who did not do the maintenance, who did not do the upkeep, and it created a catastrophe. Yeah. And that is a major red flag for me, not even just around Michigan, but around the country, is how much privately owned infrastructure is on the verge of collapse. And that's got to be a partnership between states and the federal government. And the, the wild thing is like, you know, I think for the average person just hearing these stories, it probably sounds like it's, um, you know, jargon in the government world. But to me, when I hear PFAS, Great Lakes, freshwater supply, I think of agriculture, farm, like land that can no longer be farmed because it's contaminated, right. you know, water supply, you know, they look at, you look at Flint, you look at, you know, the Great Lakes with, with, I mean, how much lake fish, I mean, you know, yeah. not only is that an ecosystem, but it's also a huge food source right. for so many people. You look at, I mean, in the UP, whether it's, you know, wild rice or, you know, maple trees or, co- you know, coastal communities, like it, the Great Lakes are not just this, um, you know, disconnected idea. It's in, it's, it's, it's a part of our everyday life. I mean, you look at the water table in, in Gross Point and the Detroit canals and yeah. we're, you know, we are, we are on a, we are very much, um, isolated by some things in global warming, but we can't really afford for the lake levels to rise very much. And obviously right. a big threat is to, you know, um, to have them go down or, you know, I, th- I know that I've, I've talked to a few friends, Nick Shrek, who's a professor over at yep. uh, Wayne state. He's a good friend of mine. And, uh, I, I, I asked him because I'm like, how have, have they not proposed the pipeline? Cause this is a fear of mine. It's like, 
somebody's got to have a, pro- a pipeline proposed to the Colorado Aquifer, yeah. basically, you know, prov- to pump water. Nick claims they have drawings from the fifties, basically, but they don't have the they didn't have the power at the time to pipe the water out. And I've seen some like you know theories out there online because I've always had this like looming fear that someone's gonna build a pipeline and run it along the highway and pump it into the Colorado River. Yeah, I mean, is this are, the, are these crazy ideas? Is this something that you think that like would spur a, a civil war? I mean, how 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 crazy is conversations like that? I mean, I don't think it's crazy at all. You just look at some of the the unrest in the Middle East right now, and if if a majority of people get to a point where they do not have basic needs, food, water, um, good paying jobs, there is rightfully huge unrest. So if we do get to a place in this country and and I watch um, in some of the regions that, that get water out of the Colorado river right now are planning for and approving developments for water they don't have. And that is devastating to me thinking about, you know, again, we as Michigan, the great lakes are not entirely ours, but we are one of the, the stewards of it. Um, What is that going to mean for us when the Colorado River runs dry and they're looking for something else? Um, How do we participate in that in a way that is not going to hurt our own residents and our agriculture? And it it is, it's not crazy. It's something that we have to think about because it's very real. And that's one of my, I was not surprised, but deeply angry that the climate funding got cut out of the federal negotiations because- it's no longer a hypothesis. It's happening and it's happening right now. And we have to plan for it. I think, and I know Nick well too, it's, we have to realize that it's a twofold problem. We have to mitigate our accelerating impact to climate change, but also plan for the changing climate. It's not one or the other. Um, We don't have to look any farther than the flooding that we saw last summer, devastating Metro Detroit, closing highways, flooding people's basements, losing everything to realize we have to build things differently because this is the new reality. Yeah. I mean, I had two, I had two cooks that lost their cars that, yeah. that night, you know, Ugh. like, like, like literally totaled vehicles. And I, again, I mean, when I think about food, restaurants, agriculture, I mean, it's all, it all comes down to water. I mean, water is, I mean, obviously we, we know that water is the source of life, but you look at the, you know, Southwest, you look at Southern California. I mean, this is a huge production area for the, a lot of the food that we eat, you know, Mexico, I mean, they produce a lot of what we consume in, in the, in America. I mean, a lot of my menu, even in peak season, you can't avoid, you know, almonds, olives, yeah. you know, l- lettuces, iceberg. I mean, there's just so much that comes out of this area that to think of it going dry, I mean, you're losing a huge percentage of the food that we grow. And you look at what's happening in Ukraine and how that's choking the global food supply. Well, and just how much of it is is tainted now, too. If I can provide one example that I'm really, really proud of is the amount of plastics that end up in our water supply that end up in fish. Uh, Cranes last year, you know, did a devastating report that a few decades ago, there were no microplastics in fish. Now, if you eat the average fish coming out of the Great Lakes, there's dozens of pieces of microplastics, which never leave your body, um, that end up in their food supply, that end up in our food supply. So... I had, I have one constituent who, when she was 14, recognized that this was a problem. she just started high school. She reached out to researchers at the University of Michigan, grad students, and came to me with an entire presentation on, I understand this is an issue. Here's one solution I have for it. And her solution was um, banning intentional release of balloons, which multiple other states have done already. Um, adding it to our litter law. And she was like, again, this is not going to solve everything. But she had actually tracked uh, how many pieces of plastic balloon debris have ended up in the Great Lakes every year. And it's it's not in, you know, it, it's not inconsistent. It, yeah. it's, a, it's a fairly sizable amount for one source of plastic. Um, so I introduced that bill. And that's a perfect example of this is an issue that impacts all of us. There are people... I represent 280,000 people. People are experts in everything or will become experts in everything. There are great ideas out there and that's the relationships we should be building to put up really simple, straightforward ideas that can help fix these issues. No, it's wonderful. And I think if every if every person in local government was doing that, right? Yeah. There's 10 million people in Michigan, right? Isn't that, yes. Yeah, yep. There's 10 million people in the state of Michigan. You represent 280,000 of them. If every single official was putting forward, if everyone was getting rid of the, you know, the, the balloon, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't have as many problems as we do in the Great Lakes. Yeah. So one thing when we sat down uh, during the pandemic, we sat down on the patio at Mabel Gray and talked about a few ideas. And uh, one of them was Pure Michigan 
uh, working more to promote restaurants or industries, food industries affected by COVID. Specifically because I would looked at, yeah, I look at Michigan in the last 10 years, specifically, uh, restaurants are a huge draw, right? You look at, you know, anchor tenants, you look at Detroit's development, Ann Arbor, Traverse City. I mean, these, these tourism, you know, meccas rely on restaurants. You stay at a hotel, you want to get a bite to eat. You look at San Marillo, you look at, you know, you look at Trattoria Stella up in Traverse City, you know, you look at the beer community in Grand Rapids. I mean, if you take away restaurants and, and, and bars, you know, what is Pure Michigan advertising for? I mean, just what, just the, you know, some shoulder seasons, a little three months of beach, you know, two months of skiing. We need these, these, these industries. And, you know, you had a lot of great ideas and things that you were working on. I would like you to share them with me. Yeah, I think, and, and I've lived in five states. Uh, I travel all the time. I think that Michigan, especially right now, has one of the most exciting food and drink scenes in the entire country. Um, super creative. We're so diverse. And I don't think we do enough to celebrate and promote that. I mean, that is something that would draw not only people from one side of Michigan to the other, but people from all around the country and all around the world come experience, you know, a, a, a food vacation um, or a beer vacation or a wine vacation. And we don't do that enough. So I would love to see um, some more production go into that. I think we've seen, and this is off on a tangent, but um, F1 gained so many followers when they did a Netflix series and they understood the power of content to draw fans into following Formula One who never have before. I mean, it's, it is the best example of content driving real results. And I would love to see us do that. Let's put some content out about all of the great things that you guys are doing, about all of the really interesting things that our farmers are doing and, you know, the cherry season, all of it. And I think it would be huge. So I've been in the ears of those who run Pure Michigan and the MEDC to well, say, people let's that, do that more. I don't know if the average person understands that's a state-run yes. organization. So Pure yes. Michigan is not like, you know, just just fun for media. This is state run. Right. Yeah. It is our official state. It's in our state budget tourism campaign. And it is when I travel the country and I talk to legislators from other states. I mean, we are the envy of other states because you see billboards in New York, you see them in California, and it touts a lot of our outdoor um, recreation, which is beautiful. It's wonderful. Let's expand on that. Right. Um, and I think that's a really powerful way to promote and buoy an industry that, that, did get hit and hit hard throughout COVID to celebrate it. Well, the thing is, if you go skiing or you know snowmobiling or swimming, whatever you're doing, you have to you eat. have to eat. Yeah, and then you know, chances are you want to drink, and you're probably you want staying in a cool hotel somewhere. It's all it's all connected, and I think that you know the restaurant scene is the backbone of of tourism. Yeah, and you know, I I'm really happy to hear that you're working on that because I think that that's a, a great way to spend the money that Pure Michigan receives, and they've done a great job. But I think that you know, pivoting a little bit. To, to, to shine a spotlight on these restaurants and areas that are affected would be, uh, seems like it would be in line with everything else you've been working on. Absolutely. Our thanks to State Senator McMurrow for joining us and thanks to you for listening and... We would like to thank LaMarca Prosecco for their support. From the hills of Veneto, Italy, you can never go wrong with Prosecco, whether it's in a spritz or drinking straight. And if you're a fan of our show, there are a few things you can do to support us. Leave us a review, tell a friend about the show, or make a donation to support our station, WDET, Detroit's NPR station. Just go to WDET.org slash give. Essential Cooking is produced by me, and Alisi, along with my co-host, James Rigato. This episode was edited, mixed, and mastered by Sam Bobian with production support from David Lyons. Original music by the Mallet Brothers. Essential Cooking is a production of WDET, Detroit's NPR station.